Hello, <clears throat> this is that long awaited for video. Actually, I don't know if anybody was really truly waiting for it. I have a feeling maybe two people. Um, <clears throat> I decided to lump everything together in one giant friggin' PowerPoint, but then I semi streamlined it. Um, this video, I'm going to cover just a few different things. It's going to be highlights from the three plant chapters. Reminder about the acidification lab. Um, chapter 35, because we covered 34 in class on Monday. And um, of course, your lecture assignment will be mentioned in here, because I'm not going to do a whole recording and not have your actual lecture assignment buried in here somewhere. So without much further ado, let's get to that PowerPoint. Um, I think this will be it. Yeah, yeah. All right, here we go. Aha, notice aptly titled for week five, because that's what this is. Told you the highlights of what chapters. So if you feel like, I was about to say, if you feel like playing along, but I don't think you're playing along. <coughs> I think it's just the, um, for people who wanna look in their book as I go. Here we go, chapter 31. No, I didn't give you the name of the chapter, but you've got it, it's plants. So I told you on Monday that there were only a few things about the plants that were actually going to be important for the course. I tried to pull out all of the most important things and um, I don't know, some of the stuff that I might actually find a little interesting. I did talk about monocots and dicots and that's why I put this here. So this is just a table trying to show you. If you remember, I say monocot is one, mono for one, so one cotyledon dicot or eudicot means two cotyledons. The eu for eudicot means true. I have been known to ask you to identify if something was a monocot or a dicot. So the way you would do this, I myself normally start with the flowers because if you look at the flowers part, it has floral parts, i.e. petals, if it's a monocot, it's multiples of three. If it's a dicot, multiples of four or five. But then you go, but wait a minute, what if there's 12 or 15? Both of those are multiples of three and five. So if you have something like that, then you look at the leaf veins. If the veins are parallel, that would make it a monocot. If the veins are branched, so it's like here and then more coming off here, more coming off, that's going to be a dicot. <clears throat> you can also look at the stems, but most people aren't going to cut the stems open to try to take a look. And most people aren't going to look at the roots, but you can. Um, I don't really worry too much about that. I go by the actual what I would see above ground. And then you've got the seed. The one cotyledon, it's going to be like corn. We have pictures later about this too. And then two cotyledons, I normally tell people it's like a bean. So if you've ever grown anything from a kernel of corn versus a bean, you'll notice the one just goes whoop and then it's there. It's just like, tsh. and the bean, normally it has these two little shriveled up things at the base. And those are the two cotyledons you see. Body plan of a flowering plant. We have the root system and the shoot system. That's pretty much the most important stuff to know. The root system is everything underneath the ground and the shoot system is everything above the ground. There you go. Okay, I said in class that the main thing I tell you to always remember is xylem up and flow them down. So xylem up, that is the part that is taking the water and all the dissolved minerals and pulling it up through the plant to distribute. The phloem is after photosynthesis, the phloem transports the sugars all back down. So xylem up, phloem down, bam, xylem up, phloem down. I swear you wanna know this. Typically this ends up being a um, fill in the blank type question on most tests. I will say blank up, blank down, or I will say for plants, I told you to remember blank and blank. If it says that, I expect you to remember xylem up, flow them down. And I think that will be the extra credit part for this week's lecture assignment. If you type 
and I mean type literally exactly into the lecture assignment, say extra credit, xyl them up and flow them down. I will give you extra credit, but you have to specify that I told you to say for extra credit, you told me to remember xyl them up and flow them down. I'm doing this because I want to see how well people can actually follow directions. So anyway, there you go. Okay, since I just talked about xylem and phloem, I figured I would show you the anatomy of a log, the way a tree is built. You have the secondary xylem. This is what's making the middle part, the inside part of your tree. It's because the tree does not just grow like this. The tree as it goes up also gets fatter. The older the tree, the wider the tree, because every year it has a new layer for lack of a better phrase, built on the outside, it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That's why you have the different rings. Your polar lab this week should also talk about this, so hopefully you paid attention. Um, the fact that we have xylem up and flow them down is also how the tree stays alive. That's why in a moment when we have some pictures of people getting sap from trees and stuff, you'll see that they never cut all the way around. If you cut all the way around, you have just cut off the nutrition superhighway, for lack of a better phrase. Okay, this is that flower I told you you are going to have to label. This looks like the one that will be in the file of to practice labeling. These are all the parts you need to remember to label. And for extra credit on the final exam, stamen, you have to remember to say is the male parts and the carpal is the female parts. All the others, you just have to memorize the words and what they are. Here are the little bean things that I was talking about. So you've got a regular bean, you die caught. If you cut the bean open, and you can totally do this with, with any bean you have in your house, you will see this little thing on the inside. You'll see those tiny two little leaves. That would become a new plant. So, you know, I'm supposed to not attribute human characteristics, but you know what I'm going to say. It's like a little baby plant in there, and it really is. And so it's this tiny little plant that will become a new plant if all goes well when you plant it. And there you go. The cotyledons are basically the nutrition too. So we've got our little embryo in there. We've got the little embryotic leaves. We've got the little embryotic root. And then we have the cotyledons, which is to feed it, and then the seed coat. Corn is a monocot. That's why I used that as an example earlier. This is known as a fruit because it's helping move it along. That's why I notice it points and says fruit tissue. Similar thing here, we've got our embryonic root, our embryonic shoot, we've got our embryonic leaf. Then we have the part that's covering it, that's the sheath. No, you don't have to label all these. Um, seed coat, fruit tissue, cotyledon. The cotyledon again is there to help with feeding, controlling, protecting, whatever, the baby embryo. But what makes the corn interesting, and here's that thing that I like to do where I will ruin a food for you just because it amuses me. We have the endosperm. The endosperm is all that goodness that will feed it, that we like to eat too. So whenever you make popcorn and it goes poof, and it makes that big fluffy thing, all that fluffy white, that is actually the endosperm of the corn. So if you want to mess around and just really upset your friends, your family, your kids, whatever, next time they eat popcorn, just go, mm, how's that endosperm? And they'll totally freak out. It's kind of funny. Uh, and yes, I've done it plenty. My kids are not phased in the least by it anymore. Which brings me to fruit, because fruit is just simply basically the flower's ovary. The flower's ovary is seriously there to pass on the seed. That is the entire purpose of an ovary. So the flower's ovary grows, thickens, matures into a fruit. So then something will eat the fruit and move those seeds along. I talked about it in class, I believe, and I talked about it, of course, maybe. Um, but basically, they're trying to make sure their seed goes far away from the mommy plant, or I should say the parent plant. And this is so they don't have to compete for resources. 
So the fruit, next time you're biting into an apple, that's literally an ovary. And so I have been known to do that to people too, say, hmm, how's that ovary? People don't like that. It amuses me though. So here's different types of fruits. Fleshy fruits are going to be the ones that actually are like, it's liquidy, it's soft. They gave you some examples. You know, we've got bananas, kiwis, oranges, apples, grapes, whatnot. And then you have the dry fruits. These are gonna be beans and nuts. Um, actually, I don't mean beans, I meant to say nuts and such. So I don't think at any point did you bite into a pistachio and go, hmm, this is fleshy. No, normally they're pretty dry. And yes, I purposely said pistachios because, oh my gosh, I love pistachios. Okay, bean germination. This is what I was talking about a little while ago about a dicot. We've got the little seed. It has that shoot. Uh, the embryonic shoot comes out to become the root. And then it just grows up towards the top. The cotyledon opens up and falls down. And so when I said the little shrivel up things, I'm going to use my little laser pointer. Um, when it grows and you see these two shriveled up things and you think these are the tiniest leaves you've ever seen, these are actually the cotyledons moving out of the way. Um, I don't know, I think it's pretty cool. And then a monocot, slightly different. It just, root goes down, shoot comes up. And you don't really see anything hanging there because it just kind of comes right on out. So there you go, chapter 32. Okay, this is about, this goes more into the xylem up, flown down, would have just talked about that, kind of recapped the previous stuff. Now we're moving into how humans are utilizing the plant transportation structures. So we have things like this. We collect maple. Well, we don't, because I don't think we have a lot of maple trees down here, but you know, you go farther north, true maple, this is how they do. They just plug it in there and let it pour right out because it is taking the phloem as it's coming down the tree. Phloem, remember that's distributing the sugars. Maple syrup is made from this. So it's literally just taking the plant sugars from the plant. And notice they're not just, you know, gouging a section. It's a little spigot. So they're seriously just tapped into the super highway. So think of it as like, this is an exit on the highway. And then here, this is where they're collecting latex from a rubber tree. Yes, rubber trees do exist. They are real. But what I like to point out here is this. You can see it's already been harvested here. It's been harvested here. Now this is the current harvest. They don't cut all the way around the tree and the tree heals from what you've cut. This is how you can continue to get more and more from the same tree without killing the tree. If they tried to get too much, then the poor tree would end up starving because we would have cut off its nutrition. Okay, I keep saying nutrition. Here, we're gonna cover this real quick. Plants, they have macronutrients and micronutrients. Macro means large. So these are nutrients that they need in large quantities. Micro means small. So these are the nutrients they need in small. Can you believe I just blanked on the friggin' word there? Anyway, so here we jumped to fertilizers because what happens with most plants? A plant takes certain nutrients out of the soil and returns certain, certain nutrients into the soil. And when they do this, if you're always planting exactly the same plant, the same crop, say carrots, um, I used to live super South Georgia in, there was a sign that I drove by every day that said, Eccles County, carrot capital of the South. And so carrots are stuck in my head. Anyway, imagine that they just keep planting carrots. They pull up the carrots and they plant more carrots. They pull up the carrots, they plant more carrots. Eventually they have stripped the soil of all the nutrients those carrots need. And it has too much of whatever the carrot is dropping off. This ends up making very unhealthy soil. Yes, soil can be healthy or unhealthy. When there's not enough nutrients, then the plant is not gonna grow as well. This is when people then start bringing in fertilizers. 
The fertilizer is the attempt to help put the stuff back into the ground that the plant has taken out. Um, typically, nitrogen is what's been pulled out the most. And this is why different farms have different ways of dealing with this. Most commercial question mark type farmers tend to use the fertilizer way because then they can grow whatever they want, whenever they want. They just spray this crap everywhere. <laughs> no pun intended. But they just spray this stuff all over the place in order to just shove the nutrients back into the ground in order for the plant to pull it up so they can, you know, not be, their production's not hampered, basically. Um, back in the day, before people had commercially made fertilizer, they would do the slash and burn. So after a crop was done, they would burn what was left and then till it into the earth. By burning it, that released more of the carbon and the nitrogen, tilling it mixed it all back into the soil. So it was like a natural type of fertilizing. Then if you look at the more productive, smaller organic type farms, the ones who are not going to go using fertilizers, this is where you get the crop rotation. This is the healthiest way to do your soil. If a farmer actually plans it out properly, they will know, I'm not a farmer, so I can't tell you the exact ones. I'm just gonna make some crap up, okay? Since I said carrots before, let's pretend, because again, I do not know which nutrients they take and leave, okay? I really don't. Let's say that they take the carrots and whatever the carrots leave behind, corn absolutely loves. So they harvest the carrots and then they plant the corn. Then the, the corn does beautifully. And then let's say that, I don't know, um, cabbage. Cabbage loves what the corn leaves behind. And so then after the corn's harvested, then they plant the cabbage. And then after the cabbage, they go back to the carrots. If you find the right few plants, you can just keep alternating crops and you will keep feeding your soil and your soil will stay healthy. You will have a wonderful, healthy harvest every year or every season, whatever, and you don't have to resort to the chemicals. So that's pretty cool. Some people wonder, but if the fertilizer is so easy to get, why don't we keep using it? Well, because sometimes it also mucks things up down the road. So we're getting there. We have inorganic fertilizers. These are the mineral fertilizers. You can actually get these naturally with the inorganic compounds or synthetic inorganic compounds. Then we have our organic fertilizers. Organic, basically, if you remember from bio one, two, three, at the very beginning, we talked about organic means life. So these are biologically derived bio for life again. This is gonna be like compost. It's gonna be something that was alive and now it's rotted. It's gonna be poop. It's gonna be that kind of stuff. It's something that has been decomposed. And so it's just mixing all this stuff back in there. It's taking advantage of the nitrogen cycle. Showing you with corn leaves, healthy versus different deficiencies. Because again, the plant needs the nutrition as well. I don't know how many people who have like gone through a cornfield. When I cover this in person, I normally tell you my story about cornfield and I'll recap it super short here. Um, 2005, six, seven, 2007, I was doing armadillo research in Yazoo, Mississippi. Yes, that's a whole story on its own. And this was the first place I had been that had massive amounts of cornfields. So one of the people I was working with, I love horror movies, I wanted to know why do people always get lost in cornfields in horror movies? So I had to test it out. So we drove to one of the cornfields. I had her park her truck facing where I was walking. I walked straight down the line of corn as the sun was beginning to set because that's what always happens in you know the horror movies. And I closed my eyes and I spun a circle and had her turn off her headlights before I spun. Holy crap. It is really easy to get lost in corn. I thought that was kind of fascinating. Those suckers are tall and everything looks alike. And um, it did get rather creepy, just so you know. But I also highly recommend it because it was kind of fun, but definitely have somebody ready to turn on the lights because I don't think I could have found my way out without those lights. And it got creepy, creepier the later it got. But anyway, if you look at the leaves of a plant, 
you can find out what it's missing. So then you can kind of put something in the soil to help make it better. There is, I think, an app out there now that says you can take a picture of your house plant and then it will tell you how to care for it. It's kind of based on this. It's going to look for any discoloration and stuff. Okay, our survival of a species depends on the soil without a doubt, because if we don't have soil, we don't have healthy plants. Without healthy plants, we don't have oxygen, we don't have food. And for those of you who don't eat plants, but you eat animals, your animals eat those plants, and so you won't have food either. Um, very important to have healthy soil. We have a lot of erosion, we have a lot of pollution, a lot of this threatens our soil. And people talk about a lack of water, people talk about a lack of clean water, you don't hear a whole lot of people talking about a lack of healthy soil because a lot of people just don't think about it. With the exception of one really obscure episode of Strange Addictions because a woman on that was addicted to eating soil, it was really weird. Um, anyway, so trying to figure out better ways to grow our crops, like water conserving, irrigation, erosion control, trying not to use herbicides or fertilizers because you use too much of that, that actually negatively affects the soil down the road um, or areas around it. If anybody ever gets the chance to go to Epcot in Florida, um, you know, there's Disney World, which is Magic Kingdom, but Disney World also has Epcot love Epcot. Epcot has a ride of called Living with the Land, and you go through it and it actually talks about all of this. It's one of my favorite rides. Yes, I am that much of a geek. I will ride it every single time I go, um, but it talks about all the different ways they're finding to grow healthier plants using less resources. It's pretty cool. Anyway, here's a sinkhole that's caused by the overuse of groundwater. Basically, they use too much of the groundwater and now there's just nothing there anymore, so the ground collapses. There are sinkholes all over the world and Florida has some serious ones. Um, when I teach environmental science, I actually cover sinkholes. If you've never really paid attention to them, I highly recommend doing a quick Google search and looking at how severe these sinkholes can get. And it's all based on, um, most of it is based on stuff that we as humans have done to mess up what's underneath the ground because we're just not thinking about it. And using too much of our groundwater, that's one of them. Dust storm. This is a huge one, that massive friggin' dust storm that they found evidence of the dust from this dust storm all the way in New York. Um, it was huge. This was due to them overusing the land. So if you remember when I talked about the importance of a healthy soil, this is where they just kept planting the same plant over and over again. This is pre-fertilizer era and they just didn't know because this was back in the day when people thought, oh, it's nature, we have to tame it. They didn't realize maybe the planet had an idea of what it's supposed to be. Um, so here, they just kept over harvesting. They kept build, they kept growing, 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 growing. They stripped the soil of all of its nutrients and then there was nothing left to hold it. And so psh, everywhere. This is an example of the negative parts of using a bunch of fertilizer because while dumping a bunch of fertilizer on the plants might give you a healthy crop, whenever it rains, that's going to wash down into the other water areas. You add all this extra fertilizer, you're gonna get the algae and stuff to bloom and get huge. When you do this, it's going to then take the oxygen out of the lake and then kill a lot of the fish and stuff inside the lake. So when you think, oh, but it's over here, we're not affecting anything, all of our water is connected. So as that goes into the, into the watershed underneath or goes down the hill into the little creek that then brings it to the little stream, which brings it to the lake, you're destroying so much by having too much crap instead of just, you know, working smarter and doing it in a healthy fashion. 
So in bio one, two, three, when we talked about genetics, we talked about GMOs, the genetically modified organisms. I kept this one in here to remind you that there's a reason why they have plant biotechnology. This is genetic engineering, but this does not mean, hey, we're making these evil things that are gonna give you cancer. At no point has any of the GMO foods been shown to actually give cancer. Um, if you were in my one, two, three, you know that this is a pet peeve of mine to say stuff like this, that they will insist they're not gonna eat an apple that says there might've been, that it might be part of a GMO, but they will sit there and I don't know, um, drink a Red Bull, you know, seriously. One is a heck of a lot worse for you than the other and I will clue you in, the apple is okay. Um, so what they are trying to do is because every two seconds, somebody dies on this planet due to hunger. So what most of the plant biotechnology is involved in is trying to come up with a greater yield. Instead of adding chemicals to kill things off to try to make it last longer, which has been proven to have developed cancer and brain, um, uh, it's not injury, basically like a brain damage, it's like affecting brains of the younger ones different things like that, instead of using all these chemicals to try to make it, this is actually trying to put different plants together to help things like having plants that don't, um, don't die off as easily with a drought because we have some major droughts. We keep getting worse and worse droughts every year because we as humans still haven't learned how to conserve anything. We're just like, screw it. I want it. So I'm going to have it, which is really kind of disgusting. But anyway, that's, Side note, you have entire areas that they just don't have the proper area to grow anything else. So think of rice. Rice grows in a lot of our poorer countries. So one of the GMOs, one of the plant biotechnologies was splicing the vitamin A into the rice plant. So then they can just grow rice like normal, but by growing this kind of rice, they're all actually getting vitamin A, which they were deficient in. Another one, the first one I ever read about, and it was in 2005, um, was where they were splicing protein into spinach plants because spinach was not hard to grow. And then people would get the spinach, so they get the folic acid and a whole lot of the good stuff for you in the dark greens, as well as the protein that they were deficient in. So it's pretty cool. Um, so before you jump off to say, oh, those are bad, they're gonna give you cancer, actually research it, not through Facebook, not through YouTube, but actual academic stuff and scientific journals to see what it's really about. So anyway, I went off on a tangent, go figure me. Okay, chapter 33, this is the last chapter of plants. This talks about plant hormones and tropism, which I think is the more interesting parts of the plants. So. Any type of growth result that makes a plant do something, that's a tropism. So phototropism, if you remember, photo is light. So this is the one where if you have a plant and you have it by the window and it's facing this way, and then you see the whole plant's leaning like that, you turn the pot around and then later you come back and it's like this again because it is leaning towards the light. Sunflowers are a prime example of this. Sunflowers follow the sun. So if you drive past a field of sunflowers during different times of day, you're gonna see them slumped over in different, different directions because it's following which direction the sun goes, which I think is pretty cool. Okay, these are the major types of plant hormones. We're gonna talk about each of these very briefly. Um, <clears throat> probably worth taking a look at. The main ones I think I'm going to talk about a little bit of the auxins, um, tiny bit about the cytokines, the gibberellins, that's like a growth hormone, the ABA, and the ethylene. Ethylene, when I tell you about the ethylene, oh my gosh, it's going to be a game changer for you. So here, auxin and cytokines, what this is at the top, see the one that says terminal bud? Notice that that plant is kind of thin but tall no terminal bud, it grows outward. So what happens here, if you've ever seen anybody with those big fat 
thick, healthy bushes, you notice that they're normally trimmed. It's because as it starts to grow out, they cut off the tops that got rid of the terminal bud. So it told it to grow outward. Then the terminal buds start to come up, you cut them off, it goes fatter. This is how they make those incredible topiary things. You know, like the bush that they shape into Mickey Mouse or something. Yes, I know I'm on a Disney kick. Um, that's how they do it. And it's because of these plant hormones. I keep getting started looking around going, yeah, my bushes are not super thick because I'm not good at trimming them. Um, if it were up to me and I didn't live in a subdivision area where people would get upset, I would have so much wild stuff growing around me so I could pretend I'm in a jungle and no one's around. But neighbors don't like that kind of thing. Jabrillins, this is the one I said, is pretty much a growth hormone. So if you see a dwarf plant, so they're, they're smaller, they're never gonna grow bigger because they don't have the same amount of gibberellic acid. If you then regularly give it gibberellic acid, that will make it grow. So this is an example. We've got the dwarf plant the way it's supposed to be. You start treating it with the gibberellic acid, it makes it grow. When I would teach this class for semester, terms, which are 17 weeks, we actually had a four week long lab where we did exactly that. And we, we treated them with the gibberellic acid. So we got to watch them grow. That was cool. Um, this is the other part for next time you go to the grocery store and you're wondering what in the world is different about these grapes. Well, grapes treated with the gibberellins grow larger than the natural ones. So when you go to the grocery store and you see these grapes, but you pick these grapes, it's because these have been treated with gibberellin. It's not that it's unnatural, but that's not the natural way for the grapes to grow. So if you wanted your normal grapes, like true untreated, grapes. So those of you who say, I only have the natural stuff, these better be the grapes you buy. Because if you buy these, you have already bought into the eating treated food. Now, again, there's nothing unhealthy about it. Same exact nutrient level. It's just, you know, you need to know. Okay, here we go. Um, ethylene gas, this is my big one. Uh, this is the one that basically tells things it's time to ripen, okay? So here we are. Notice they're showing you that the peach is very close to this banana. This banana ripened faster than this one. What happens is the fruit is giving off, once you have plucked it basically, it's giving off the ethylene gas. It gives it off, encouraging all the other fruits to ripen and fall off the tree. This is the reason why when you buy that container of strawberries, you pick it up, you look around, you notice there's these little holes, the little slots or whatever in the container. Um, all these strawberries look great. You get home, you open it and you're like, oh, these are great. And then you find that nasty one in the middle and it kind of radiates out. All the ones on the outside are in better shape than one in the middle. If you picked a box of strawberries that was underneath another box, that one probably wasn't looking as good because each of those strawberries are letting off the ethylene gas, encouraging the ones around it to hurry it up and ripen. Um, this is why it's important to either spread them out or get one of the they sell these stuff, they sell them at Whole Foods. You can also buy them on Amazon. It's these little papers. You throw it in there with your fruit and it absorbs the ethylene gas and your ethylene will, I mean, your ethylene, your fruit will last so much longer. This is also the reason why if you have ever gotten any kind of fruit and you took it out of the container that had the holes to let the air in and out and you put it in a closed container, it all went bad quickly. This is also why if you keep a bunch of fruit in a bowl together and you don't rotate it, you don't move it, you will notice that some of it goes bad so much faster. Um, if you've ever noticed, 
This one's fun to do. Anyone can do this. Your bananas. If you buy a bunch of bananas, separate them and pull them away from each other and compare that to how much longer those last versus the ones that are right next to each other. You can also wrap up the little stem part of the banana. That will help make them last. But seriously, the easiest way is to just get those little papers that you can throw in with your fruit. Um, a few months ago, got some at Whole Foods for my mom for her to try. She, swear by, she swears by them because she's only one person living in her apartment and she wants to have the fresh fruit and was getting frustrated at how fast it goes bad because she can't just go to the store every couple of days. So she was a great one to test these papers on and it worked beautifully and enough so she went through those and I ordered her more through Amazon. Um, we tend to eat our fruit pretty fast so I haven't gotten to really play with it at our house but I might start doing like a little um, like a little experiment with it because it's pretty cool. But anyway, if you want to save your fruit and keep it from going bad fast, don't lump it all together. Make sure that air can circulate. Get one of those things. Oh, and that's also, by the way, where that phrase comes from, the one bad apple will spoil the bunch. That's litter or the barrel. That's what it means is because if you have one rotten apple in there, it's letting off that ethylene like crazy and it's destroying everything around it. Okay. Tropism, back to the tropism. This is what's telling the plant to do something. So we already talked about phototropism, which was the stimulus of going towards light. We also have gravitropism, Gravi, gravi, gravi for gravity. This is what's telling it to have the roots go down and the shoot to come up. It's literally going by the gravity. So if you start to grow a plant, and I mean, it's teeny tiny, like if you have a clear cup and pressed up against the side so you can see that the shoot is coming up and the root is going down. If you take it and flip it upside down real quick, put it back in there, don't damage it, but just flip it, you'll see that it will then right itself again. It's pretty cool. And then thigmatropism. This is response to touch. My favorite example for this, I don't know the actual name, but I learned it as the sleeping fern because it looks like a fern, but when you touch it, it curls up and it looks dead. I saw this in Belize, absolutely loved it. And this is a defense mechanism because if you're a plant, you know that you're gonna get eaten by animals. So imagine a grazing animals going along there, just nudging things with its nose. And when it touches you, you curl up and look like a dead thing. The animal's not going to eat you because it wants the leaves. If you look dead, it's just going to kind of keep moving along to something else. So I think that's pretty cool. Brings us to the herbivores that are mostly eating plants. Um, again, plants protect themselves. The thigmatropism is one way. Physical barriers like thorns is another way. And chemicals are another way. So all these different plants have ways to try to protect themselves. This is, I think, one of the most disturbing and the coolest. So the caterpillar is going along munching on the leaf because that's what caterpillars do. But that lets the plant know, oh my gosh, something's killing me. So it releases a chemical that attracts a wasp. The wasp, it's like, ha ha, that's the dinner bell. Well, not quite dinner bell, but the wasp receives those chemical um, signals, comes flying in, sees the caterpillar, and this is the most disturbing one, lays its eggs inside the caterpillar. So then as the caterpillar is munching on the plants, the wasp's eggs are growing in the caterpillar. It does not immediately stop the caterpillar from eating the plant, but by having this happen, that caterpillar is not going to become a butterfly. And so it the plant basically used a very disturbing form of birth control right there. So pretty cool. All right, here's the acidification lab reminder because we're done with those three chapters of plants. And I keep checking the time too because whoo, my throat, I've been talking for a while. Okay, the acidification lab, I talked about it in class. Not everybody was there. Um, I know one person said that they had come in late and one person I know was not feeling well. And thank you for not coming to class when you're feeling ill because 
you are remembering that we are in a pandemic and we need to try to be safe and care for each other. So thank you. Um, the acidification lab, this is basically to mimic acid rain or the acidification of something. In bio one, two, three, when I taught osmosis, what I did was I dissolved the shells off of raw chicken eggs. And then we used that as a, um, a single cell. So we watched the different concentration gradients with the egg. When I soaked that egg in vinegar, that was basically an example of acidification. So what this lab is, you have to write up, do your own experiment and just write it up. So say that you want to see what would happen to, um, I don't know, we'll say a nutshell because you know I've got pistachios on my brain because of earlier. So you take a pistachio nutshell and you look at it, take a good look, throw it in the vinegar for an hour, a day, two, whatever, take it out, rinse it, and see if there's any difference. If we had a longer amount of time to do this, I would have you do shells and like do specific drops on there. And then after, like each day, put a drop, put a drop, put a drop. And then after a week or two, rinse it off and see if there's a difference. Because acid rain is not literally acid coming from the sky. It's because of the amount of stuff, for lack of a better phrase, in the air that settles and you don't see it. And then when the rain comes, the water from the rain kind of activates what's been settled there and it causes a chemical reaction and it's like acid, it's a type of acid. So whenever you look around and you see a stone sculpture or rocks or bricks, concrete, anything that looks like little pits in there, like someone's going tick, 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 and taking it off. That is the effect of the acid rain, that is acidification. So this lab is you just doing your own version at home. Um, yeah, so I'm also gonna say this because I realized I meant to say it at the beginning, totally forgot. Um, I am going to extend the acidification lab since it took me so long to put this out there. I'm going to extend this until Wednesday. And the lecture assignment has also been extended till Wednesday to make up for having not gotten to it fast enough. So my apologies on that part. Um, hoping the extra couple of days will help keep you on track. I can't give you more than that because we are almost done. There isn't any more time, but this should at least give you a little buffer. Okay, now, <sighs> chapter 35. Okay, I don't know if anyone has watched Meerkat Manor. It was actually kind of interesting. Great study in, um, well, I was, it's just animal behavior. I was trying to think of the actual name because when I did the armadillo research, that was one of the, well, they weren't studying meerkats, but they were studying the behaviors of these armadillos and there's an actual term for it, but I just cannot think of it right now. Um, but anyway, so researchers using Meerkat Manor, they were looking at meerkats in order to see anything about the evolution of cooperative behavior, sexual selection, altruism, and components of social behavior. And so, oh, behavioral biology. Why was it so hard for me to think of that name? Behavioral biology, that's what that, that part is called. Meerkats, they're cute. Yes, it's like Timon from Timon and Pumbaa from Lion King. Uh, stuff we're covering. Here we go. Behavior. Behavior is the sum of the animal's responses to internal and external environmental cues. We all have some form of behavior. Behavioral ecology is studying that behavior in an evolutionary context where you are considering the immediate and the evolutionary reasons. Um, proximate, immediate, ultimate, evolutionary. And natural selection, we've talked about that before. This helps preserve the behaviors that enhance the fitness. Remember, fitness does just not mean, who I am in great shape. Fitness means best suited for that area. 
Pretty sure I've already talked about the sneaky frog, so I'm not gonna recap that, but that's a prime example of the fitness. So innate behavior. This is performed the same way by all members of a species. This means it's not going to change. Fixed action pattern. You will see it as FAP continuously through here. Please, in class, the way so many people will just start giggling at FAP. It just means fixed action pattern when you are talking about biology. So these ensure that activities that are essential to the survival are performed correctly without practice. So this means when something happens, you always react this way. Example, we have a, a gray lag goose. The goose is retrieving the egg. The goose is on its eggs. It notices there's an egg over here. That's not where it's supposed to be. All the eggs are supposed to be lumped together. So the goose is gonna pull and put that egg right back there. Nobody came up and told that goose, the egg has to be there. The goose just knows all eggs have to be together. Penguins, the king penguins, if that egg touches the ground, the baby penguin inside the egg will die. It is too friggin' cold for that tiny little egg to touch that frozen ground. So they have to transfer it from one, one of their feet to the other one's feet and then protect it from all the cold. No one taught them this. It's just fixed action. This is the only way it's going to survive. They could have seen others doing it. Could be something from the hindbrain that's just there from, you know, instinct. Don't know, but it's the same all the way. Okay, behavior results of both genetics and environmental factors. So your genetic code is going to influence some of your behavior. There are certain things straight up are in your code. That's why you're going to do some of the stuff you do. Um, sometimes it's literally passed from, you know, person to person all the way down. Sometimes it could be something was done that altered the genetic code a tad. Example for that would be when a woman is pregnant, what she does does directly affect the baby. Women who smoke while pregnant, they have found it actually alters the brain chemistry and stuff in the babies that these babies have a tendency to have more attention issues, more anger issues, um, stuff like that down the road because they were altered in utero. If you know someone who comes from a long line of short-tempered people and they are also short-tempered, but they are like one of the calmest people on the planet. They had a wonderful upbringing. Their parents didn't beat them, nothing like that. You have no idea why they just snap as easily as they do. Totally could be from genetics. However, sometimes that's also from the environment on other stuff that's happened around them. So one, leatherback sea turtles, these guys, genetic code for these guys. They hatch from their eggs. They go towards the light, which is supposed to be the moon shining over the ocean. And that's why they go that way. I say it that way because light pollution has been one of the number one things that have been killing the poor little turtles because if there's too much light this direction, typically that's not on the ocean. The poor little guy hatches and goes towards the light and then gets run over by a car. So certain areas, like I wanna say St. Simon's, Jekyll, stuff like that, during hatchling season, they have a ban on when you can have your lights on outside. And that's to help them go towards the ocean. Um, it's imprinted on them from when they hatch there, they go here. And so when it comes time for them to lay eggs, they come back to the exact same location where they began, which is pretty friggin' cool. Here is the cross experiment. They had a mommy rat that gave a whole lot of interaction to her babies. Then they had a mommy rat who kind of ignored her babies. So the ones who had the mom who was always there taking care of them, a lot of touch, a lot of um, well, care, these babies grew up to be more chill. And then they took better care of their babies. Um, 
low interaction mom, the one who just kind of ignored them, these are the these babies grow up not as I hate to use the word confident, but they're more jumpy. And then these grew up not taking care of their babies. So what they did is they then took these babies and swapped the babies to see what happened. If they took babies who were from the high interaction mom, gave it to the low interaction mom, those babies ended up not doing so hot. So this is an example of environment. This is honestly 100% why if you see someone who's taking care of their baby, they're holding their baby, they're doing things with their baby, don't go up there and say you're just going to spoil it. Please, for the love of God, don't tell people that they just need to teach that baby that they need to just not, they're not going to be picked up or held every time they cry. Babies cry for a reason. They're not little manipulators. Manipulation doesn't start until you're a toddler. And that is entirely up to the parent to be there for the toddler for real things, but also nip it in the bud when they start doing the whining. Don't reward the bad behavior, but listen. Um, this right here is an experiment that explains a lot of issues with a lot of people. So please, anyone who's a parent, actually give attention to your kids, please. 100%, please. Okay, so box stuff again. Learning, we have learning, which is modification of behavior because of very specific things. So we have habituation, which is just a habit. This means that the animal learns not to respond to something because they just get used to it. Example, I believe in the textbook is about you having a roommate who every time they study is humming. It really annoyed the crap out of you at first, but now you're used to it, so you don't even notice it. Um, <clears throat> that's one they give right there. Um, I have less pleasant ones. Like if you have a if you have a dog and you tell it to come here, and it comes, and then you punish it for something it did. And then you tell it to come here and it comes and then you punish it for something that it did instead of you actually addressing the situation where the dog had the accident. What you are doing here is you are literally teaching your dog not to come because every time it comes, it's getting a negative response. So not really a good thing. So they learn not to respond. Um, sadly, this also happens with kids. If a kid is asking for help and you keep ignoring it um, or you smack them every time or I'll give you something to cry about, any of those types of things, eventually they're not gonna ask for help anymore. So yeah, they might not bug anybody around them anymore but that's not actually a good thing, just so you know. So <clears throat> habituation, loss of response to a stimulus after repeated exposure. Imprinting, learning, that is irreversible and limited to a sensitive time period in an animal's life. This is gonna be kind of like when that turtle woke up, or not woke up, hatched and it imprinted on that area. We have another example of imprint in just a moment. Spatial learning, this is where you're learning landmarks. That's also part of that turtle. Associative learning, this is a behavioral change based on linking a stimulus or behavior with a reward or punishment. That also goes with what I was talking about a second ago and includes trial and error learning. So associative learning is great example is when you study for a test. Say that you're like, okay, I need to do well in this class. I need to do great on this test. And you mean to test, you, I mean, you mean to study. You don't quite get to it, so you try to cram some crap into your head the night before, and then you take the test and you don't do well. You're like, oh, can't believe it. But then you're like, okay, this time I'm really going to try. And every couple of days you look over your material, you reread it, you rewrite it. I'm a writer. I'll write and I'll type because that helps it in my head. Then the test comes around and you've actually stayed up with it and you ace that test. You were not stressed. You did great. You got like a 98 on that test. You are so happy and so proud of yourself. Then the next one's coming around. You've been a little busier 
but you want that good grade. Are you going to go, hey, maybe I did well on that test because I studied? Or are you going to say, oh, it's just because I understood the material more? The behavioral change takes place when you choose to keep doing the proper studying in order to have it get into your head. You have now learned this is the right way to go. Um, social learning. Learning by observing and mimicking others. Oh my God, this is the mask issue right here, I swear. If you go somewhere where a lot of people are wearing masks, um, if you're one of the people who's just like, yeah, whatever, you, you haven't decided if you really think you should wear a mask or you shouldn't wear a mask, you look out there, you see most people wearing a mask, you're gonna put your mask on because that looks like what the social norm is. You go somewhere where almost nobody's wearing a mask, people are making fun of people wearing masks, are you going to wear your mask? I, I will, I'll tell you that honestly, I'm going to because I understand that me wearing a mask has nothing to do with me, it has to do with me showing respect to you. Because right now with the pandemic, you wear the mask to protect other people from you. It's not a fear thing, it's a respect thing. And I wish to show respect, so I wear a mask. Um, so even if I go somewhere where no one's wearing one, I'm gonna wear a mask because I think that is the right thing to do and I don't wanna be a hypocrite. So there you go. Um, that's type of a social learning. You can look at groups of people, you can look at cultures, religions, counties, schools, families, you will see social learning all over the place. Um, we have a slide about it in a moment and then I'm gonna tell you another story with it that has nothing to do with people, masks or COVID, so yay. Problem solving, so cool. This is just where you figure out what to do. And again, we have great examples of that. First, imprinting. Learning that is limited to a specific time and period. It's a very specific time. It's a sensitive spirit, sensitive period. It's so funny, I'm seeing the stuff about birds. I'm hearing birds go nuts right over here. Oh, there's one right over there. I would show you, but I don't think me spinning the thing would actually show you the bird. And I would tell you what type it is, but I don't know. It just makes me think Mary Poppins. You feed the birds, what do you get? Fat birds. That's what's in my head right now, sorry. Okay, so examples of imprinting can include young bird learning to identify its parents and the song development in birds. If a bird, a young bird does not hear the proper song, it's not going to know that song. Here's an example of imprint. <clears throat> when the geese hatch, they imprint on the first being that's in front of them, that becomes mommy. And that is who they will follow. That is who will teach them everything for their entire life. So here's an example of these geese imprinted on this dude and they followed him everywhere. Did I get rid of the picture of him flying? Nope, it's the next one. So imprinting poses a problem when you're trying to use conservation programs. If you're trying to save a species that is almost lost, and this species will imprint on the first thing around it, you have to be very creative to not mess up the species. So here's an example. This is a whooping crane that they were trying to bring back from the brink of extinction. They didn't wanna mess it up because how the baby is fed and treated teaches the baby how to interact and feed its babies in the future. So they had to do a proper whooping grain parent. I thought this was the coolest thing. I thought this was pretty brilliant on how they came up with it. And I want that job. That would be so cool. And then teaching them how to fly because they have to take them up and show them this is your migration pattern and that kind of thing so they can learn it. They just need to be shown it by a parent once and then they're good to go. So these are their imprint moments. Um, <clears throat> kinesis, random movement in response to a stimulus. Taxis, response directed towards or away from a stimulus. And spatial learning. Animals establish memories of landmarks in their environment that indicate the locations of food, nest sites, prospective mates, and potential hazards. It's just learning um, all in its own way. Spatial just means locations. So this is giving you different examples, knowing what's gonna be there, what's not gonna be there. Uh, I found this one interesting, the bottom one about the digger wasps, where 
they had these things wrapped around the pine cones around the nest. And so the digger wasp knew this is where I go. They moved the pine cones away from the nest. And now the poor digger wasp can't find the nest because it just knew it was in the middle of the pine cones. Thought that was interesting. Okay, migration, regular back and forth movement with animals between two geographic areas. Most people, well, I guess most people think of birds when you think of migration. I was gonna say most people think of elephants because that's what I always thought of. Mainly because growing up, I remember um, World Wildlife Fund trying to, they would sell different parts where you could help purchase blocks of land on the African elephant migration path because they were trying to buy all the land on the migration in order to protect it so people couldn't poach the elephants there. So that's what I think of. But we have a lot of things that migrate. The example in the book here is gray whales. They use the topography, the, the bumps and valleys and stuff of the ocean floor, temperature, chemistry, everything in order to know which ways to go. So the gray whale actually migrates from location to location. And the turtles we were talking about, they also migrate. They follow this pattern and then they come back and then they lay their eggs and then they continue. This is just what they do. Associative learning, ability to associate one environmental feature with another. Um, <clears throat> kind of like what I was saying before, call the dog, punish it, call the dog, punish it. It knows, don't come anymore. If you have ever been around a person or an animal that has been hit a lot, you will notice if you move your hand in a certain way or too fast, they immediately go like that or like this. It's because they have been taught that this means pain. And so they know to, you know, be ready. Um, but you also have, I'm gonna give a couple examples here because I find this one fascinating. Say that you have a little kid, little kid's whining, throws a tantrum, and you give him a cookie to get him to be quiet. You have just taught this child, pitch a big enough fit, you're going to get what you want. If when a kid is doing that, oh, but I want it, think, oh my God, I freaking hate whining. Just, oof, that was a house rule in my house, no whining. You could tell me anything you wanted to, you could complain, you could vent, don't whine. I hate whining. Every time you tell a kid or even an adult that you think it's cute, you have just positively reinforced that behavior. Every time you give in, you give a treat, you buy the toy, you do anything because when the person whined, associative learning, that person, even if they don't mean it, is learning this is how to get what they want. So some behaviors that are extremely manipulative the person doing it might not even realize they're manipulating you. It's because at a young age, they were taught this gives you this. And how are they gonna fix that if you have basically built it into them? So pay attention to what you reward because a negative or a positive both instill behavior. This is also why like in our classes, I don't say you lost points, I award you points. Because the more points you get, the better you feel. You earn them. You're more likely to try to earn more points. Anyone who's had me more than one term gets all excited eventually and starts actually doing all the work because you have learned you doing the work gives you all the points. You have a much easier time by the end of the term. Totally in your power. You. We have just had an example of associative learning. Um, anyone who's gotten a really good grade from me, when we have the in-person stuff, you'll see I draw a smiley face. We're adults, but there is something about having that stupid smiley face. You're like, yeah. When I was in biochem, the teacher had stickers that she put on the quizzes. I can't tell you how hard I worked to get that stupid sticker. I was in my, what, 30s, 40s. I don't know. I think I was in my 30s. And... I had to have that stupid sticker. I could have gone out and bought the stickers, but there was something about getting my little quiz bag with a sticker. I wanted it, all associative learning. Um, other types are called trial and error. 
where an animal learns to associate one of its own behaviors with a positive or negative effect, like whining, like tantrum throwing, things like that. Social learning, again, this is where you learn by everything around you. Uh, it says many predators, including cats, coyotes, and wolves, seem to learn some of their basic hunting tactics by observing and imitating their mothers. This is why you see the mommy wolf shows, the baby wolves, coyotes, cats, they all play. If you watch them when they're babies, when they're cubs, when they're kittens, they play, they play hunt, they play fight, they play all these things because they're learning how to do things by what the mom does, what she does, how they do things. Pretty cool. Um, alarm calls for these monkeys in Kenya show another example. They see something bad, they alert. They're like, oh my gosh, there's danger. And so they shout it out and they all learn to do it. Um, the other social one that I was going to mention, I always mean to get a picture and put it in here, but I can't remember. It's a type of monkey, it's a type of primate in this one location where they started, one of them apparently started taking the sweet potato and washing it in the ocean and then eating it. Wash it, eat, wash, eat. Basically, in essence, was salting the sweet potato. I thought that was pretty cool. Now you have this entire, I wanna say tribe, but this entire group of monkeys that whenever they have the sweet potatoes, they all dunk it in the ocean because they all learned from each other. And I thought that was kind of cool. Cognition, process of perceiving, storing, integrating, and using information. Problem solving is where you take all of your information and put it together to figure it out. Some bird species do this. A lot of mammals do this. Dolphins and primates are the prime examples. You see a problem and your brain kicks into gear and you're like, hmm, I'm going to figure this out. Now, I like to take a moment here to point out, I would love for people to Google this because it is fascinating, cows. A lot of people just think of a dumb cow, but cows actually are great at problem solving and they get all excited. There are these tests that have been done where the cow had to figure out a puzzle and the puzzle is like figure out how to do something to get a treat. But you will see when the cow figures out the proper puzzle, it actually like jumps up and down I'm like, woo, I got it. And it's, it's pretty cool. Um, Great problem solving example is they took, I think it was a chimpanzee. I'm not sure, but it's one of the higher up primates. And they had it in a room. They had some fruit up on a shelf and just some random stuff laying around. No way to actually reach the fruit. And this primate looked around and figured out by grabbing the different boxes and stuff and stacking them that it could climb in order to get to get the fruit. And so that is an example of problem solving behavior. Um, I'll tell you, my kids, when they were little toddlers, oh my gosh, the stuff they figured out on their own to reach things was insane. Now, granted, they also hurt themselves often because they kept doing this. Well, not they, Pax, my oldest. He would do things like decide he wanted to change. Yes, we had videotape then. Um, he wanted to change a tape in this player, but I told him he had to wait and he would stack all these videotapes to stand on top of it to try to reach it. Needless to say, they would fall. Each time he would try it, he would try something different, but he knew the issue was he just had to be higher to get there. And he did trial and error until he found a way to get up there. So that was pretty cool. Okay, survival and reproductive stuff. Foraging, foraging for food. This is where you know what you need and you go get it and you eat it. So search image, this is the mental picture of the desired food. So basically you think what you want. All the animals will think what they want. That's how they can find it. It's not just a mistake that they get what they need. Optimal, optimal foraging model means that the feeding behavior is going to maximize the energy that you get versus what you use. So if you ever look at, um, if anyone likes Pixar and Disney stuff, Pixar, they have this one of this little sandpiper and they all run in there to the water and they pick up the little, the little mussels from under the water and they pop open the shell and eat the little bit of meat inside. And this little one is scared. He got knocked under the water, stuff like that. 
at the end, you see he's bringing all the big things. That wouldn't really happen because the amount of effort it takes to open one of the bigger shells takes more energy than what you would get from inside it. And that's why normally they go for a certain size. This is why if you see a bird go for certain seeds, they're going for the ones that they can pop open easiest. They're going for the ones that use the least amount of energy. Um, whatever's more abundant and easier to get, they're gonna eat it because it takes less energy to get there. And so that's pretty much what this is trying to show you is that the amount of prey available, it's going to go for what? Um, that's pretty much it. Early humans were hunter gatherers but we know that they also got some stuff from hunting or more from gathering than hunting. This is because while meat might be nutritious, it's giving you the protein and stuff, it was hard. It was very dangerous. And sometimes people weren't gonna come back. It took so much energy in order to get it that it wasn't quite worth it. And this is why they did more gathering and foraging than they did hunting. That is why in all of the evidence from way back when, you see some documentation of meat, but you see more of the other stuff. So uh, communication, have to be able to communicate with each other. There's various types. Sometimes there's a signal, sometimes there's actual other stuff. So we have forms of communication. We have odor and sound. We have visual and auditory. Fish might use visual, electrical, or sound. And honeybees do this little dance in order to show what they're talking about. This is a lemur showing aggression. It's letting you know it is not a happy camper and back up. Kind of like if a dog um, you know, has the head a little bit dipped and the tail is down and you hear that's letting you know back up. Cat tends to be, or the tail, stuff like that. They're, they're letting you know, go away. Uh, mating behavior, a lot of it is based on the communication because they have to know that it's a good match. Um, various rituals, some have actual rituals, some are not. We have mating rituals where like for the peacock, the big plume of feathers. And it's like, whoosh, look how elaborate I am. And I have not been eaten. This means I am a good survivor. And that's why the peahen then picks him. Um, this is honestly why so many of the male species are so flamboyant in order to get the mate, because the attitude is, look how much attention I get. And yet I'm still alive. You want my genes to make sure your baby survive. And that's pretty much why they pick it. Um, other times it's a chemical thing, like cats and dogs. The female goes in heat. It just means, hey, I'm ready to have a baby. Things like that. Courtship display of the male sage grouse. I always keep this picture in because it just makes me laugh. It's like, puff up. I don't know. He's, he looks funny to me. Okay, then we have promiscuous, monogamous, and polygamous. Different species have different systems. So we have promiscuous, which means no strong pair bonds. They just bounce back and forth. It doesn't matter. Typically in these, there isn't a whole lot of care for the young. Any species that is promiscuous tends not to take care of the offspring, um, straight up. It's because it's just to make sure that genes are passed on and we don't give a crap if they survive because we're going to have as many as possible. Statistically speaking, some of them should survive. Monogamous, mono for one. This means one male, one female, they share taking care of the young. So a monogamous system for biology means mom and dad stay together to take the best care of the baby possible. And then polygamous. This means one individual of one sex mating with several of the other and 
typically is one male with many females, mainly because when the female gets pregnant, it's going to take a while for the baby to come out. So it takes time. But the polygamous ones still, they bond together and they take care of their offspring. Um, so that's the basic way to break it down. Let's see, needs of offspring, certainty of paternity, help explain the differences in the mating systems and parental care by males. Then just some pictures. This one I think is so cool. This is a male jawfish. The female lays the eggs, uh, the male fertilizes them, and then he holds them all in his mouth until they hatch. He has guaranteed no one is going to hurt his babies. That's pretty cool. Endocrine disruptors. These are things that are going to mess up the endocrine system, which can then mimic a hormone and mess things up. So some of these are going to be waste from factories. And so it says like PCBs, PCBs, polycarbonate by something. I already forgot what it is. But anyway, that's one that's in like, if you get different plastic bottles, it's going to say something about these. And then DDT, talked about it previously. Um, that's the whole reason Rachel Carson wrote the book Silent Spring. It was talking about how dangerous DDT and certain pesticides were because it was messing things up and making it where the babies were not getting born for these animals. Endocrine disruptors have been linked to a slew of these different things. It's just showing it's messing things up, which then messes up the future of that species. It totally mucks things up. And again, when you look at the endocrine disruptors, they're just talking these types of things. We have the same thing with our human behavior. Some of the chemicals people consume also mess things up. You have to be careful. We are chemical beings and every choice we make does affect that. And we have a bad habit of not paying attention and not caring. So think these things through sometimes, please. And then it's just showing some more pictures, social behavior, social, sociobiology. There we go. Uh, social behavior, any kind of interaction between two or more animals, the discipline of sociobiology is literally studying those behaviors and how they interact. Pretty sure you're going to know that a territory is an area where they're like, hey, this is my location, stay the blank out. There you go. Nesting territory for these birds, to me, this pretty much gives me anxiety. They terrify me as a little kid. I didn't know about any of this stuff. And I walked upon uh, a point in Long Island, Little Baconic Bay area, and I came upon the nesting area of seagulls. And I still remember how mad they got and me running for like, ah, trying to get away from them. So that many birds in one spot scares the crap out of me. Coyote. Marking its territory. Yeah, it pees on things to let you know, hey, this is mine. This is why dogs go along and, and then they pee on top because they're trying to say, no, this is my location. And so they keep just trying to claim it. Pretty much when the cat goes on something, they're doing the same thing. <sighs> I swear we are almost done. Oh my gosh, this is taking forever. So we then also have agonistic behavior. This is what they do to make things go away. This is how they're trying to chase other things out of their territories to say, this is my spot, go away. And so you've got rattlesnakes. One rattlesnake wants to move into the other rattlesnake's territory, so they fight. The winner keeps the territory. Dominance hierarchy. Um, so funny when I was a kid and I heard pecking order in chickens, it never occurred to me. It was literally pecking, but that's really what they do. They will peck the crap out of each other. And the one who stays standing, that's the top chicken. Um, females in a wolf pack, same thing. They will fight. You have all these different things where you've got the main one and then the main one, and then it goes down line. That's what that is. Pecking order of chickens. I think those are some of the most fascinating looking chickens. I have never seen those colors in real life for a chicken. Okay, a lot of social behaviors tend to be selfish because they're just trying to maximize their own survival. Altruism is a behavior that will reduce the individual's fitness 
uh, make it where they're less likely to survive, but it will increase the survival of those around them. So that's altruism. Um, this is going down to kin selection where they basically, some species will do things in order to make sure that their family survives. And here they're talking about ground squirrels providing support for kin selection. This is a naked mole rat nursing offspring while surrounded by others who are kind of making sure she's taken care of. This is the ground squirrels where it shows the number of times a female ground squirrel gave out an alarm call to warn others that danger is nearby. If they had descendants like their children nearby, they were more likely sh to shout it out. If they had relatives like moms or sisters living around them, they were more likely to shout it out. If they didn't have anybody around, less likely to say anything because they're like, I don't want to get munched on. Let that one get it. Whoops, I hit it twice. Okay, we got a lot of our understanding about this stuff from chimpanzee behavior from Jane Goodall. She actually went out there, stayed in the field, stayed around them long enough that they just got used to her presence so she could really watch them as themselves. This is how she discovered so many different things about chimpanzees. And her research demonstrates the importance of descriptive or qualitative data in science. You have quantitative, which means a whole lot. That's numbers. That's something you can count. So quantitative means you can count it. Qualitative is the amount of quality. So by her staying out there, she got so much detail. And so she has books, lectures, shows. She has explained so much about these chimpanzees. And that is Jane Goodall hanging out with her chimps. Um, one of the big things was how much the mom and the baby bonded with chimpanzees. It's pretty cool. <sighs> okay, again, is it genes or is it the environment? Is it, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the phrase we were brought up with and it is just not in my head right now. Um, Gosh, it's right there, like tip of my tongue right there. Uh, the whole thing is basically if you're born with it or if you learned it. And you have people who argue back and forth which one it is. Nature versus nurture. Oh, thank God I remembered it. Nature versus nurture. And some people say it's all just nature. Some people say it's all just nurture, but in reality, it's both both of them go together. And that's pretty much what this is telling you. Certain genes will account for some stuff, but genes themselves do not totally dictate the behavior. The genes just mean you have a tendency to lean a certain way, but you can be taught not to do that. So near the beginning of all this, I talked about someone who's all the way down the bloodline, they have a short temper. But I also specified they don't, they don't beat anybody, they don't hit, they don't throw. It's just they lose their temper. That would be an example where that's the gene part, but the nurture part, the behavior part was they learned not to take it out on other people. They learned how to recognize it was happening and pull it in. This is a lot of the part for the mental health counseling because you have a lot of disorders where the genetics do this, but the therapy involved is to teach the behavior. So it is both, 100% both. Um, talking all about this stuff, social biology, how it goes with people. And that brings us here. So whew, that was a whole lot of stuff to talk about. And I'm going to keep scratching my nose because it's getting itchy. I have the windows open and now it's not rainy. And I think the pollen is starting to come in and now I'm like, itch, itch, itch. I'll probably find like mushrooms sprouting at some point and that'll be my issue. But anyway, next week, week six, all online. We don't meet on Monday because it is July 5th, which is the day that we are observing the U.S. Independence Day. 
Our final exam is week seven. So we are literally almost done. You have to finish week five and you have to do week six and then final exam. That's it. That's all we've got. So do not forget to do the stuff online. Yes, I'll be making a video faster for the last week because I can't extend it. So I'm going to try to get to that either later today or tomorrow to get that done. Um, <clears throat> don't push things off. Get your stuff done. Don't forget to get the acidification lab turned in. Turn in your polar lab and your lecture assignment, critical thinking weekly writing, and your quiz. You have a lot of stuff to do this week. Make sure to get them all done, get them turned in, get ready. And um, have a safe Independence Day. If you have pets, know that this is the worst day for them. They are terrified of fireworks. People with PTSD also tend to have an issue with fireworks. So I really wish they would stop doing the fireworks because it actually causes more anxiety to a lot of animals and people. And the 4th of July and the 5th of July are the dates of the year that most animals, that have the highest rate of animals that get lost because they try to escape those sounds. So if you're one of the people who decides to shoot these suckers off, just know this. Um, if you're going to do it, how about also donate to the local animal shelter that's going to be taking care of the animals that get lost. That would be cool. So I guess that's it. I'm going to close this. Well, if I can get there, end, and then stop. So then we can finish like this. And yes, oh my gosh, I talked a lot. So I will see you on our last day of class. Peace out.